morning, brethren and sisters. <clears throat> prepare, our, prepare our minds this morning in partaking of the emblems. It's good that we can look at characters of the Bible to be able to draw lessons from them, to be able to apply not only uh, today and then during our days of probation, but beyond. We uh, certainly can help ourselves and each other in these lessons that we can draw from them. And the character, as uh, Brother Regan mentioned this morning, is the uh, character study that we did uh, for the uh, Texas uh, gathering down in um, Lampasas. And it was one that I had done on Jezebel. And uh, there's many lessons that we can draw from this most notorious woman of the Bible. It made me wonder, really, what made her so notorious? What made her tick? What did she really represent? And so we want to take a look at the uh, marriage between Ahab and Jezebel, see what kind of lessons that we can derive from them as a married couple. And we also want to look at their interactions that they had between each other. So there are kind of three things. Oh. In a while. Here we go. <clears throat> so it says Lamb Passes 2012, but anyway. So the three things we want to take a look at for this are first of all, we want to look at the, the woman herself and who she was. We want to uh, have a look at her marriage that she had with Ahab and the lessons that we can draw from that. And third, we want to see what kind of a type she was and the lessons that we can pull from that. And um, so we find in studying this, and, and actually uh, Brother Kelly did a, a pretty comprehensive study on Ahab when he was going through the Kings on Wednesday night class. So if you remember some of the things that uh, Brother Kelly mentioned, this will hopefully just uh, add to it and maybe fill in a few of the, of the details. Ahab was a Jew, and we find that Jezebel was not. So it makes us ask the question, first of all, uh, that they were their marriage was really couldn't have been for love. So if we had a Jew and a non-Jew, it was to so that two nations could have a common interest. They were trying to thwart off war, and they were trying to uh, um, make a convenient alliance, as it were. So let's just take a quick look at Jezebel herself and see uh, what we can find out about her. Jezebel was born and raised in Tyre, and it was the influence and the example of her father, Ethbaal, which caused her to grow to the woman she was. So we've got to look at Ethbaal to find out some information. Ethbaal actually means with Baal, and so he was. Ethbaal was the high priest to the chief goddess of the Phoenicians, Astra. This we heard of from a Sunday school talk this year. And she went by many names, Ashra did. She was named Astarte, or Ishtar, Athor, and she re- represented a productive power. Well, in the chief god in that time, of course, was Baal, or Lord, and he represented the generative power. So the thought is that the original husband of these goddesses, the, the husband of Ashtoreth, was the Canaanitish god El, E-L, and that Baal was their son, who eventually became Lord. And of course, around all that became the myths, as we don't have time to talk about, but the historical figures of Nimrod and the wife and the child. But this was the religion of Jezebel, and she would have passed that on to her daughter, Athaliah, who in turn grew to be very wicked, much like her mother Jezebel. In fact, if we look at Athaliah, she was married for the purpose of a two-nation alliance as well, and which led her to kill for power, in fact, kill her own family members. Athaliah brought the gods of her mother over to Judah, and then the people there began to worship foreign gods instead of the one true God. It says in Chronicles, For the sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman, had broken up the house of God, and also 
All the dedicated things of the house of the Lord did they bestow upon Balaam. So we go back to Ethbaal. He was not content in just being the high priest in Tyre. No, he wanted to become king priest. So it caused him to murder the king, which in fact is thought to be his own brother, and therefore he took over the throne of the Phoenicians in Tyre. Jezebel was a most willful, determined woman, and more forceful character than Ahab, her husband. It says whom she incited to do the most abhorrent practices. In 1 Kings 21, verse 25, it says, But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. So we see who was behind the stirring up. Her name ironically means chaste, and though she was really anything but that. She was associated with the worship of Astarte, as we mentioned, or the groves, with the religious rites and forming, uh, involving all forms of uncleanness. But her name originally meant, the prince Baal exists, Jezebel. In biblical Hebrew, Jezebel means, there is no nobility. Being that she was a princess, she would have been used to all the fame and the glory and she thought by marrying into the family of Omri, she wasn't about to give up anything, including her status as a princess, her gods, and her attitude towards mankind in general. And thus she brought with her the worship of foreign gods and introduced them into Israel. She is described as arrogant, domineering, overbearing, and having dictator-type qualities. It's not quite those you'd expect of a princess. And thus we see in her a spirit that represented her character. So what is this spirit? It's called the spirit of Jezebel. A Jezebel spirit seeks control through manipulation. It has a deep hatred of true spiritual authority and uses emotional pressure witchcraft, and obsessive sensuality in its pursuit of power. It uses subtle persuasion to gain influence and get close to those in control, and then uses this position to gradually dominate. In the Hebrew, Jezebel means without cohabitation, and it's true, she will not cohabit with those she cannot dominate and control. She will have no equals. Control is what Jezebel wants more than anything. Even when Jezebel appears to be submissive, it's usually out of a carefully wrought plan to gain influence. Now, although it may be common to refer to Jezebel as she, we obviously must conclude that as a spirit, Jezebel is gender neutral. Jezebel certainly has as many male slaves as female slaves. However, since Jezebel initially tends to establish control without the actual use of physical force, she is more easily associated with classic feminine persuasion techniques. Jezebel likes to appear close to leaders and use their influence. She likes to use the power and influence of others to accomplish her goals and control her environment. In 1 Kings 21.8 we read, Jezebel wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent them to the elders and nobles of the city. It's typical of Jezebel. She prefers to remain concealed in the background while she manipulates situations and leaders. And Jezebel is often associated with pleasure, especially sexual pleasure. She will use any form of sensuality at her disposal to gain influence and control. Jezebel uses sensuality but make no mistake, Jezebel is seeking control. Lusts are merely tools used to weaken others in order for her to accomplish her goal of, of control. And in many cases, sex was not involved at all. Jezebel's greatest enemy is true spiritual authority. As Jezebel opposed Elijah and Herodias opposed John the Baptist, so Jezebel today opposes righteous authority in her heart, she despises all moral authority. 
And yet the responsibility lies within us to stand up and be steadfast against this spirit. Elijah, we can see, is a great lesson for us. He confidently removed the priests of Baal with Yahweh's help. He had a fellowship meal with Ahab and then ran ahead to stand at the gate awaiting the good news of reform from the city. But when he heard the pronouncement against him by Jezebel, he took off in fear and depression set in. And yet God showed him that he was standing next to Naboth's vineyard, a faithful man. And Obadiah saved the lives of 100 prophets. And there were still more that had not bowed to Jezebel's authority and God's. He said, go back and strengthen those that remain. Go back with a still small voice of encouragement. Do we, or can we, brethren and sisters, open our eyes to see the weak, to see the needy, the sick, the strong, and encourage them with a still, small voice? Oh, we think they need the fire and wind and earthquake. But Yahweh tells us to use the still, small voice. Back to Jezebel. <clears throat> her dressing in finery and putting on makeup before her death. This is interesting. It led to the association of use of cosmetics with painted women or prostitutes. In 2 Kings 9 verse 30 we read, And when Jehu came, was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out at a window. If we look at the CV, it kind of puts it into modern language. It says, Jehu headed toward Jezreel. And when Jezebel heard he was coming, she put on eyeshadow and brushed her hair. Then she stood at the window, waiting for him to arrive. Jezebel had one last defense. Being a harlot, she was going to try and seduce Jehu. The main characters in the life of Jezebel were all affected in one way or another by her evil deeds. Ahab, the king and her husband, he was a weak-willed man whom she dominated and led to do much evil. She encouraged him to worship idols while she personally made sure all the prophets of God, the ones she could catch, were killed. She personally took care of the prophets of Baal, giving them direct access to the throne. Jezebel's domination of her husband was directly responsible for the whole of Israel falling into sin of idolatry. The whole nation suffered a famine and caused by the lack of rain. And it was God's judgment on them. It was particularly humili humiliating for Jezebel since Baal was supposed to be the god of weather. Interestingly enough, the famine, it is said, went as far north as Tyre. Well, that's where she came from, remember? It says even that F. Baal was calling upon Baal to alleviate the famine. Hmm. Wasn't the famine a punishment from God as a direct result of his own daughter? When Elijah killed all the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel... Jezebel soon got on his case and she threatened to take his life. Elijah knew that this was no empty threat and he ran for his life. The mighty prophet of God who had raised the dead, he had called down fire, soon became afraid and even depressed because of Jezebel's actions. She not only worshipped idols but practiced witchcraft. We take a quick look at her marriage to Ahab. It would soon tell us and show us an example to the sisters of what not to be like. Oh, as well to the brothers as to what they need to aspire to or practice in the home. Simply put, Ahab was spineless. He couldn't make a decision that stuck. Or worse yet, he couldn't even make a decision without her stamp of approval. I took this picture and put it on the, uh, on the form here. And I, I put, if you took an x-ray of Ahab's back, it might look like this on the right-hand side. Spineless. He was a very poor example of a spiritual leader in that home. And as a result, Jezebel took the role of king, you might say, in that all the decisions that came about during Ahab's reign 
were directed from his wife. In fact, as we said, the priests of Baal had open access to the throne on her request. Here we see the curse that was placed upon the woman back in Genesis. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. It says that her desire would be to her husband. It doesn't mean that she would desire him, but that the woman would always desire to be equal to or better than the man. And God says that that must be fought against, just as much as any sin that goes against his laws. And today, society makes it very difficult with women's movements and equal opportunity groups, etc., that have popped up. It creates in the sisters a difficult thing to overcome. And thus, brothers, it is our duty to lovingly guide the household in a spiritual manner, not lording over, but guiding. We are told to be the spiritual leaders of the house, bringing our spouses and children to the truth and nurturing them through the difficult times. Sisters must not have the attitude of Jezebel, the domineering and sought-after equal role. God has designed from the beginning a role for each, and if we truly understand our roles, we will be honored to fit into them. Brothers, we are representing Jesus Christ, while the sisters represent the ecclesia. And as the ecclesia is to submit to Jesus, so too the sisters submit to their husbands. As Jesus loved the ecclesia, so too brothers are to love their spouses in the same way. There is no confusion on this matter. It is clearly stated in scriptures the order and the proper manner of a husband and wife. We turn to Peter, where he says, If you are a wife, you must put your husband first. Even if he opposes our message, you will win him over by what you do. No one else will have to say anything to him, because he will see how you honor God and live a pure life. Don't depend on things like fancy hairdos or gold jewelry or expensive clothes to make you look beautiful. Be beautiful in your heart by being gentle and quiet. This kind of beauty will last, and God considers it very special. Long ago, those women who worshipped God and put their hope in Him made themselves beautiful by putting their husbands first. For example, Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her true children if you do right and don't let anything frighten you. If you are a husband, you should be thoughtful of your wife. Treat her with honor because she isn't as strong as you are and she shares with you the gift of life. Then nothing will stand in the way of your prayers. Finally, all of you should agree and have concern and love for each other. You should also be kind and humble. Don't be hateful and insult people just because they're hateful and insult you. Instead, treat everyone with kindness. You are God's chosen ones and He will bless you. The scriptures say, do you really love life? Do you want to be happy? Then stop saying cruel things and quit telling lies. Give up your evil ways and do right as you find and follow the road that leads to peace. The Lord watches over everyone who obeys Him and He listens to their prayers, but He opposes everyone who does evil. This has been brought out clearly in the examples we have just been talking about. And it is so interesting that in the New Testament, two Old Testament wives are mentioned. One is Sarah, and the type that she emulates, and the other is Jezebel, and the type she emulates. Both knew the truth. But it is what you do with it that defines the way that Yahweh is pleased or angered. Both she and Ahab knew the law of Yahweh. Yet it was her determination to have all the prophets of Yahweh destroyed. It was she who subtly led the children of Israel away from following after Yahweh. And Ahab, as the shepherd, should have pulled out the law, read it in the hearing of the people, stood up to the air, and held true to the statutes and commands of Yahweh. Jezebel is not only visible in society, but Jezebel is finding quite at home in the Ecclesias. 1 Kings 21.9 In those letters she wrote, Proclaim a day of fasting, and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people. 
But seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them testify that he has cursed God, both God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. With a heart of ice, Jezebel gained control of Naboth's vineyard under the pretense of a fast. Interesting. She suddenly got religion when she needed it. Remember the adulterous woman in Proverbs 7? She first lured the foolish young man with, I've just finished making my peace offerings and I've come looking for you. Well, she made sure that he knew that she was a good religious woman before she seduced him. Likewise, Jezebel doesn't let her sin keep her from the ecclesia. Jezebel often manifests within the most spiritual people you will ever meet. In the Ecclesia, Jezebel will first attempt to get close with flattery. She will attempt to gain confidence. She calls herself a prophetess and often manipulates others with her spirituality. Her deep truths usually result in condemnation and burdens for those in her care. If we, like Elijah, see and oppose her deceptions, we will find ourselves in a fight for life. Many a man of God has unwittingly had this spirit of control drive out his godly leadership. And while Jezebel often claims to have inspired messages, of course she calls herself a prophetess, she usually discourages other prophetic voices unless they are under her control. She will attempt to cause leaders to be suspicious of true prophetic messengers which bear the testimony of Jesus. This same controlling spirit may manifest in very different, even opposite ways. For example, a controlling, super-spiritual, self-righteous, manipulative mother, the kind that wants to perhaps run an ecclesia or home, will often be horrified when her daughter grows up to be immoral. Little does she know that she released that very spirit into her child's life. It is with the history of this period in mind that Revelation 2 verses 20 to 23 makes mention of Jezebel. She accelerated the spread of false worship in Israel and persecuted the prophets of Yahweh. But at length she and her children were utterly destroyed. In the days when the apocalypse was given, false teachers were making inroads into a spiritual Israel and corrupting true worship. It says, seducing my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Collectively, these apostates were called that woman, Jezebel. The fate of Jezebel and her children is the same as that decreed for the apostates. He, con he continues, I will cast them into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation and I will kill her children with death. Revelation 2. Thus we learn the lesson to cleave fast to the word of God, not to be led astray by false theories and philosophies which have their force their source in the fallible human mind. Prove all things and hold fast. With the passing of time, false teachers gained the upper hand in the midst of the ecclesias. The truth was corrupted and lost, except for a small and persecuted remnant. The Jezebel class developed further and matured with the emergence of the Roman church as head over all the churches and a persecutor of the true witnesses. In the hour of judgment, she, like Jezebel, is likened to a woman arrayed in purple and scarlet. She is called the mother of harlots. As in the case of Jezebel, the latter-day Jehu, the Lord Jesus Christ will swiftly and completely destroy this evil system. How do we recognize this Jezebel spirit in ourselves or others? Well, first we must rid ourselves of Jezebel's ways. We cannot cast out lust when we harbor lust in our lives. We cannot bring down a spirit of control if we use manipulation and hype to control the members. We must examine our ways and repent of Jezebel. Secondly, it takes Jehu. Although Elijah was Jezebel's enemy, it took Jehu to trample Jezebel. He took no prisoners, and he showed no mercy to Jezebel. He had singleness of purpose, and he was driven. As he approached Jezreel, those who saw his chariot noted that he drives furiously. And when others offered peace and compromise, 
Jehu responded, How can there be peace as long as the harlotries and witchcrafts of Jezebel are many? Jehu would not rest until Jezebel was dead. Her pleasures could not attract him. Her threats did not deter him. He would not tolerate Jezebel. Jesus says we too cannot tolerate Jezebel. Revelations 2.20 We must learn the prophetic power of the word no. We must give no ground. When Jezebel attempted to captivate Jehu, he didn't even allow himself to be drawn into conversation with her. Instead, he called on her eunuchs to cast her down from her balcony. We must not get mixed up in the hype of this Jezebel-spirited worldly thinking. But instead, we must read and study Yahweh's word. Read and use the pioneer works that have reestablished the truth. They are a great help when faced with opposition. This is pretty small. And unto the angel of the Ecclesian Thyatira write, These things set the Son of God who hath his eyes like unto the flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not put this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put none upon I will put upon you none other burden. But that which ye have already hold fast till I come. We see later on in Revelation the effect this has had on the world affairs as Yahweh sees it. In fact we see this woman's presence in all of the religious systems today. Revelation 17 verse 4 says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones and are of all uncleanness. Is this not a description of the churches today? Is this not a description of one who corrupts the truth today? It's interesting, we have just looked at the woman Jezebel. She appeared to be beautiful. She drew away many after her. But when they went to bury her, all they found was dead men's bones. It says, And they went to bury her, and they found no more of her than the skull, the feet, and the palms of her hands. Her skull, her feet, and the palms of her hands. She looked good. And she may have had authority. But her walk, her actions, and her thinking was after the flesh. She was serving herself. Yahweh wants our hands and our feet and our thoughts to be directed towards Him at all times so that He may come and find us worthy to be accepted into the true marriage of the bridegroom and the bride as it was designed from the beginning. We must examine ourselves as we partake of these emblems to see what spirit it is that we emulate and take care to always manifest a spirit of Christ. The short message is left for us. Hold fast till I come.